الرحيم الحمد لله حمدا كثيرا وطيبا مباركا فيه وصلوات الله وسلامه على نبينا الأمين وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وعلى من تمسك بسنته بإحسان إلى يوم الدين ثم أما بعض وكنت حديث نمبر 3 in the series of the Ahadith of Al-Imam al nawawis Al-Arba'in. And it is the Hadith of Abu Abdurrahman, Abdullah ibn Umar. May Allah be pleased with both of them. He said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Buni al-Islamu ala khamsin. Shahadatin la ilaha illallah. وأن محمد رسول الله وإقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وحج البيت والصوم رمضان. This hadith has been collected by an Imam al-Bukhari and al-Imam Muslim, so it is متفق عليه the highest level of hadith in the Deen of Allah. Again, the narrator is Abdullah ibn Umar, whose kunya was. Abu Abdurrahman. Abu Abdurrahman. So his name was Abdullah and his eldest son was Abdurrahman. And that goes in accordance with the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inna ahabu al-asma'i wa allahi Abdullah wa Abdurrahman. The hadith said that the most beloved names to Allah is Abdullah and Abdurrahman. So we have this companion Abdullah ibn Umar having his eldest son and calling him Abdurrahman. It shows the fiqh of this particular person. Now I want to remind you brothers that you can tell a lot about a Muslim, his understanding in this religion, his commitment to the religion, his upbringing. You can understand a lot about a person before you even begins to speak by how he names his children. What kind of names does he choose for his children. Unfortunately, many of the Muslims in the Arab world and other than the Arab world, they name their children names like Suzanne, names like George, names like Diana, and so forth and so on. So whenever you see a Muslim, he says that his daughter's name is Suzanne or something like that. Out of all of those names from the companions, all of those names from the righteous people in the Quran, all he can choose is Diana because he liked the story of Princess Diana, for an example. So our Kalam is the statement of Allah, Do you want to replace what is better for that which is lesser? So this companion, Abdullah ibn Umar, him and his father were companions, and Allah be pleased with both of them, and he was one of the six companions that narrated the majority of the Ahadith. He was one of the six that narrated the majority of the Ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have to add on to those six, three other ones who are known as the Abadah. The Abadah. All of their names was Abdullah, like this one. They were four. And the four of them constitute six of the companions that narrated the majority of the hadith. The four of these ones. And just to show the importance and to help you remember the names, each one, his name is Abdullah. So the plural of Abdullah, because the four is the Abadala. The Abadala. Abdullah ibn Umar. Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As. Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair. Abdullah ibn Az-Zubair. Those four are called the Abadala. So the student of knowledge should know that. So like when you say this hadith, the Shaykhan, they narrate the Shaykhain, al-Bukhari Muslim. They know the two Shaykhs, Bukhari Muslim. Shaykh al-Islam, he said that. Shaykh al-Islam is an Imam ibn Taymiyyah. The Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. When you hear, that's the opinion of an Imam who is known as the Imam of Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. That's Imam Ahmed 
So when you hear about the Abadana, it's those four. Don't add into them Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhum ajma'in. He said that he heard the Nabi al Mustafa al Mushtaba al Mukhtar sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al Sadaq al Masuq say, Al Islam has been built upon five pillars. The first one is the Shahada, La ilaha illallah, and Muhammad is his messenger. The second one is establishing the Salah. It didn't say just making prayer. It said iqam salah establishing the prayer. And we'll explain the difference between establishing the prayer and just praying. Number three is for a person to give the zakat. And number four, in this hadith, he said making hajj to Allah's house. And he put it before the fifth one, which is fasting in the month of Ramadan. So we know that Hajj comes after everything. But in this hadith, he mentioned Hajj before Ramadan. But there are other narrations in which he mentioned Ramadan and then Hajj was last. So this is the hadith that we're dealing with today. Anyone who is paying attention to the class, the book, you will see that last week, on the last time that we was here, we were here, the hadith of Jibril, sallallahu alayhi when Jibril came and he said, Ya Muhammad, what is al-Islam? And then Jibril told him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-Islam is to be a witness, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad rasulullah to establish the salat, to give zakat, the fast of Ramadan, and to make hajj for those who have the ability to do so. Jibril said, you spoke the truth. And then he went on to ask him, what is Al-Iman? And what is Al-Ihsan? And give me some signs of Yom al -Qiyam. So, is this a hadith? Repetition? Why would Al-Imam know when we bring this hadith? And it was already mentioned in hadith number two. We, as Muslims, have to understand the ulama of Al-Islam, the scholars of Islam, when they write books, when they say things, there's always a hidden meaning. Hidden because most people don't see it if you don't have knowledge yourself. There's wisdom why Al Imam Al Bukhari will put this hadith there, and why Al Imam Al Bukhari will put that hadith over there. He started his book out with the first hadith that we took in a note, Innam Al A'malu Bin Niyat. That's the first book, that's the first hadith in Sahih Bukhari. Verily, the deeds will be based upon your niyyah. And then he put many thousands of hadith. The very last hadith that Al Imam al Bukhari put in his book was Kalimatani, Khafifatani, Al Nisani, Habibatani, Il Rahmani, the Qiratani, Fil Mizan. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah wa Abim. That's the last hadith, telling us the virtues of that dua. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, subhanallah al -Azim. Why did Al Imam Bukhari put that first hadith here and that last hadith there? When you look and you study the books of the ulama and how they made the tartib of things, you'll find they're always trying to do something. It's like the one who is an elder when you speak to him and he starts to speak and you're young, you just hear some basic sentences. But then what he's saying is nur, if you just pay attention. If you just pay attention. So the first hadith in Sayyid Bukhari, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ One of the reasons why Imam al-Bukhari put that first is what we told you when we took that hadith. And that is, the scholars of the past said, every book should begin with this hadith to remind the people of the importance of the niyyah. Every book that you study, that you write, it should begin with this hadith. And also, if you look at the chain of narration of that particular hadith, all of the people in the chain of narration are people from Mecca. And Imam Bukhari's Sheikh Abdullah ibn Zubair al Humaydi is from Mecca. His Sheikh is from Mecca, and his Sheikh is from Mecca, all the way up into Umar. So they're all from Mecca. So it's as if Imam Bukhari is saying, 
al Islam began in Mecca. So I'm going to start this hadith, my book, with this hadith of the ulama from Mecca. And then it ended in Al Medina. So the very last hadith in Sahih Bukhari is a hadith where everybody in the chain of narration is from Medina. Everybody in the chain of narration is from Al Medina. Only when you sit and you study books with people or you get the explanations that the ulama wrote about these types of things will you get this connection and the Quran is the same way. Every surah of the Quran has a connection to the surah that came after it or the surah before it. Every ayat of the Quran has a connection to the ayat before it and an ayat after it. But only people endowed with knowledge have the ability to see that. That's why you can't leave yourself as a person who doesn't read. You can't leave yourself without saying, I'm going to be a mujahid to make efforts to go out to learn this religion. Because if you just sit and you allow knowledge to come to you on the khutbah to Jum'ah, when you hear a cassette here or there or CD here or there, you'll pick up some things, but you won't be all that you can possibly be as it relates to knowledge and knowing your religion. So now, Al-Imam Al-Nawawi Rahmatullahi Ta'ala Alayhi, he already brought the hadith of Jibril that mentions this issue, the five tools of Islam. But this third hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar, it gives us some added information, a bayan that the other hadith didn't give us. This third hadith, although it's shorter than the second one, is telling us that these five things are the most important things in Al-Islam. These are the pillars of Al-Islam. Now, he mentioned already the hadith that included these five. It's already included. So why mention it again? Because these five things are letting us know that Al-Islam consists of a foundation and it consists of things that are built upon that foundation. So it's from the Jawami and Kenan. You can see why Al-Imam Nawawi would bring this hadith inside of this book that's dealing with the Jawami and Kelim. Only those hadith that the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that had far-reaching implications and wisdoms and benefits and virtues. It's from his Jawami and Kelim in that, look how he's teaching the people. Buniya al islam wa al-Khams. He said Islam is built upon five things. Everybody, whether he is a muhandis, whether he is a builder, whether he is a carpenter, whether he is an electrician. He doesn't even have to be involved in the profession of building. But everybody knows the importance of the foundation of any and everything that's built. Everybody. So he's teaching the people some information that resonates in the mind of everyone can pay attention and know if these are the foundations of this particular thing, then these things must be important. Everybody knows that. Everybody. It doesn't mean by any stretch of the imagination that these five things are the only thing in Islam. How could it mean that? These are the things that Islam is built upon. So we look at this building right now. This building has pillars. It has a foundation connected to it. You can separate the foundation from everything else intellectually. This building also has, in addition to the foundation, it has walls, it has doors, it has windows, it has a lady side, it has a first floor, second floor, third floor, it has a roof, it has doorknobs, fans, and a slam as well. Islam has these five foundations that everything else is built upon. Everything else. But this is not all of Islam. But these are the most important essentials of the religion. And if these are the foundations, if the foundation is weak, one, two, three, four, all of them, then what's built upon it is going to be weak. If the foundation is not there, then what is built upon the foundation is not going to really be there. Because... Because everything is predicated upon the foundation. Let's have a very quick look at that. This hadith is not telling you Al Islam is only these five things. There's another narration similar to this hadith that was collected by Imam Ibn Hibban on the authority of Umar as well. Radiallahu anhu. The Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, 
الإسلام إقام الصلاة وإيتاء الزكاة وحج إلى البيت والاختصار من الجنابة He said Al-Islam is and he didn't mention the first pillar He said Al-Islam is establishing the salah giving the zakat making hajj to Allah's house and fasting in the month of Ramadan and cleaning yourself when you have janaba. So if a man has a wet dream if a lady comes off of a period if you have relationships then you have to make janaba. So Janabi is from Al-Islam. It's not just these five pillars. Janabi is from Al-Islam. Someone say, Ya Rasulullah, Ayyu Islam khayr. Ya Rasulullah, what's the best Islam? What is the best Islam? He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and tut'in al-ta'am wa tusallam ala man ta'rifu man la ta'rifu. The best Islam is for you to feed people food. It's from the best Islam. It's part of Islam. And also to give salams to people you know and people you don't know. So from Al-Islam is feeding people. And from Al-Islam is saying salam alaikum. Another hadith someone said, Ya Rasulullah, ma hu afdal al-Islam. What is the afdal? One hadith they said, what is the khayr? What is the best Islam? In another hadith they said, what's the most superior aspect of Al-Islam? What is afdal and islam The Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told them, Men salim al-Muslimun, min lisanihi wa min yadihi. The superior Islam, part of Islam is, for the Muslims to be safe from your hand and to be safe from your tongue. That's the afdal of al-Islam. That's a part of al-Islam, in addition to these five pillars. Now if these five pillars are being compromised, then the other things are going to be compromised. And there are many, many ahadith that show us that al-Islam consists of many other integral props. This hadith is showing this is how the prophet used to teach. Al-Islam is built upon five pillars. But these five pillars, they are not the sum total of Al-Islam. Islam is more comprehensive than that. Al-Islam is a complete way of life. He says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Min husni Islam and mar Tarkuhu ma From a person's good Islam, is for him to leave alone what does not concern him. So part of you being a Muslim in Islam, part of Islam is, don't be nosy. Mind your own business. Mind your own business. Because everybody here has enough to deal with concerning his own personal life. And concerning those people who are connected to him. Where do you get time to start worrying about Fulan and Allah? Where do you get time for that? So whenever you sit around people and they waste time making ghiba, qila, waqab, he said, she said, he did that, he said that, those people you got to cut them off because uh, uh, shaitan is shaitan. He has led that person astray. Hey, hey, Abu Usama, you have more than enough concerning your own life, your own life, your mother, your own life, your father, your own life, your relatives, your own life. How are you going to pay your bills? How your family members going to stay on at this department, dealing with the issues confronted my own children, my own family, my own self. So the point is, part of Islam is minding your own business. He says, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, in the Islam, bada ghariba wa sayyud ghariba fatuba al muraba." Islam, the religion that has these five pillars, has a wall, has a roof, has different floors, different doors, different windows. He said, Verily Islam, it began as a stranger and it will return as a stranger. So what does that mean? Part of being a Muslim is you have to have sabr on your Islam. Part of Islam is you have to have sabr. Wherever you are, as a Muslim, Islam began as a stranger. It began as something that many people didn't like, many people didn't want it. It goes against the way and the life of the majority of the people. So Jannah for the ones who are strangers, meaning the ones who are patient. So part of Islam is a sabr. And we can keep going on, we can keep going on, we can keep going on, but I think you get the message. The five pillars of Islam are the basic main essentials. And then you have these other issues. Then you have these many other issues. So that's the way the Prophet taught Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's not saying that Islam is only these five things. And Islam 
is all of that. Now we come to the issue. Buniya al-Islam. An Islam is built upon five pillars. Ikhwani, many of the people, especially during this time, they define al-Islam as peace. We should stop doing that. That is not a good definition of al-Islam. In al-Islam, there is peace, inshallah. And Islam wants peace. But this definition of Islam is a cop-out and it is apologetic. We want to show the people Islam is free from the shidda and the tashaddud and the zulm of these extremists and these radicals. And that's our responsibility. But let's do it with justice and let's do it with knowledge. Not let's do it in the way that pleases them because they'll never be pleased with you and they'll never be happy with you. So what? You said Islam means peace. That's going to cause them to pat you on the back and you're, you're messing up the meaning of Al-Islam. Al-Islam, it means what the Prophet said in some ahadith when Jibreel said, what is Islam? He didn't say Islam is peace. He gave up the five pillars of Islam. That's the prophetic definition of Al-Islam. Linguistically, Al-Islam, it is Al-Istislam. Al-Istislam, it is submission. That's a better definition for Al-Islam. Get away from that, Islam is peace. That came from Muslims who want to be apologetic. There is peace in Islam, but Al-Islam is not peace. That's not the meaning of Islam. Al-Islam is what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he told Jibril, that's the prophetic definition. And when you look at the Quran and the Sunnah, Al-Islam is Al-Istislam, submitted to Allah Azza submitted, being a Muslim. And everything in creation is a Muslim to some degree, whether they submit willingly or unwillingly. Willingly or unwillingly. Concerning this Islam, there are three particles, three components that you brothers have to really remember and understand. And Islam number one is and it's Islam in that the Tawheed, submitting to Allah of Tawheed. Not just submitting to Allah, and that's just kalam. You have to submit to Allah of Tawheed. You submit to Him and Him alone. You love Him and you don't make shift in your love and your obedience and your fear. Submitting to Allah alone. Number two, the other component, the other component. And obeying what he told you to do. Obeying what he told you to do. So if a person is going to be a Muslim in Islam, can't just say, I'm a Muslim, and then you don't pray, and then you don't wait hijab, and then you don't fast in the Ramadan, and then you don't give down with Allah, and then you don't, after claiming you're a Muslim, and you've submitted, you don't respect your parents. No, you have to do what you've been told to do. And whenever we make mistakes, we do what we were told to do, we make toba. Number three, the third component, al baraatu min al-shirk wa ahli. Al-Islam is freeing yourself from shirk and from the people of shirk. First, is saying, he submitted to Allah, but he says, Ya Allah, Ya Rasulullah. That's not submission to Allah. He says, I'm a Muslim. I submit to Allah Azza wa But he believes in magic potions. He believes in sihr. He's a practitioner of sihr. He goes to the graves. So in order for a person to be a Muslim, he has to separate himself from a shit and from a mushrikeen. One of the last surahs that was revealed, Surat at tawbah The other name for Surat at tawbah is al bara and bara which means to free yourself. That ayah came down, many of the ayahs, that surah came down, and many of the ayahs are commanded Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions at the end of his mission, free yourself now from these mushrikeen. All of the previous contracts that you made with them when you were weak and you had to work with them, all of this is null and void now. This thing at the beginning where you had to turn the other cheek, and you don't fight them? No, that's over now. You have to fight them now. Many, many ayat came down. This surah al-bura'ah. 
Allah starts the surah out by saying, Bara'atum min Allahi wa rasulihi ila al-nadheena ahadtum min al-mushrikeen. Which means separation from Allah and His Messenger towards those people from the mushrikeen that you used to have contracts with. Contracts not to fight. Contracts, so many contracts. They made at the beginning with the mushrikeen to preserve the community because they were up and coming and they were weak. That's the first ayah. The ayah after that and then the one after that. Allah Ta'ala mentioned wa adamu min Allahi wa rasulihi ila nasi yawm al-hajj al-akbar anna Allah bari'um min al-mushrikeen wa rasuluhu From Muhammad came to the Kaaba sallallahu alayhi wa sallam after conquering Mecca at the end of his life. And Allah revealed this ayah. Make the proclamation, make the adhan. Make the adhan to the people of Mecca that Allah is free from the mushrikeen and his messenger is free. And make this proclamation and announcement on the day of the Hajj al Akbar when he was performing the Hajj. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and all the people were there. He sent one of his companions before he went. He said, You go to the Kaaba, go around the Kaaba and proclaim. No mushrik can be tawaf anymore. They were still in Mecca. They were going to come to, they were still in Medina, about to come to Mecca. He said, Ali ibn Abi Talib and other companions, go to Mecca and go to the Kaaba and say, make the announcement, after this year, no other mushrik can make tawaf around the Kaaba. So one of those many ayat, Ya ayyul ladina amanu inna man mushrikun al najis, فَلَا يَقْرَبُ الْمَسْجِدَ الْحَرَامِ بَعْدَ عَامِيَمْ هَذَا Oh you believe, very the polytheists, they have nudges, they're dirty, shirk, they're dirty. So do not let them come to the masjid of Haram in Mecca after this year, because you have to free yourself from them. And there are many ayat and ahadith about this. وَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي إِبْرَاهِيمُ الَّذِينَ مَعْهُ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ إِذْ قَالُوا لِقَوْمِهِمْ إِنَّا بُرَآءٌ مِنْكُمْ مِمَّا تَعْبَدُونَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ كَفَرْنَا بِكُمْ وَبَلَى بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ الْعَدَاوَةُ وَالْبَغْدَاءُ أَبَدًا حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا بِاللَّهِ وَحْدًا You people have in Ibrahim a perfect example. You have in Ibrahim and those who followed him a perfect example. When they said to their people, We are free from you and from what you worship. And there has appeared between us and you enmity and animosity until you worship Allah alone. So any Muslim is not able to be distinct, distinctly apart from shirk and mushrikeen, something's wrong with your Islam. And being apart from the mushrikeen doesn't mean you can't live next door to them. You can't work for them and with them. You can't go to school. It doesn't mean that. It means that your life is distinct from their life. A person looks at you, the way you behave, the way you look, without you even talking to him. He can tell this person is different. Whether he's black, brown, white, yellow, pink, blue, man, woman, tall, rich, not rich. As for the one you look at him, you can't tell. You don't know what his religion is. And this is what's going on with our kids right now. Day in and day out, day in and day out, their Islam and their Islamic fiber is being chiseled away. So, your wife has to make jihad to make sure there's some time where she's trying to sit with those kids, teaching them Arabic, teaching them the Quran, teaching them aspects of the religion. So that's the meaning of Al-Islam. So Al-Islam is funny, it is comprehensive. It is the deen. It's the way of life. It's not just a religion. It's the way of life. Buddha al Islam. This Islam and this way of life, it has been built upon these five things. How do we know that al Islam is a way of life and that's what's meant? Many, many ayat of the Quran. So we have to get the correct understanding of the deen. Like this hadith is telling us Islam is built upon five pillars. Doesn't mean that's all of al Islam. There's more to Islam. Because Islam is your whole deen. It's the way you sit. It's the way you eat, it's the way you speak, it's the way you present yourself, it's the way you relax, it's the way you vacation, everything is Islam, it's your deen. Allah mentioned in the Quran, وَمَنْ يَبْتَلِي غَيْرُ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا 
فلن يقبل منه هو في الآخرة من الخاسرين anyone who chooses al-Islam anyone who chooses other than al-Islam as his way of life it will never be accepted from him and Yom Al-Qiyam is going to be of those people who are the losers لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ وَلِيَ الدِّينُ what does that mean? to you your religion to me my religion to you your way your life and to me is my way and my life many ayah are saying that in the deen and the law and Islam the religion the way of life that Allah accepts is al-Islam many many ayah شَرَعَ لَكُمْ مِنَ الدِّينُ مَا وَصَّى بِهِ نُوحَ وَالَّذِي أُوحِيْنَا إِلَيْكَ وَمَا وَصَّيْنَا بِهِ إِبْرَاهِيمُ وَمُوسَى وَعِيْسَى أَنْ أَقِيمُ الدِّينُ وَلَا تَفَرَّقُوا فِيهِ Verily, it has been legislated as a way of life for those who went before you like Noah. And what we have revealed to you is the revelation of the way of life. And we revealed this same revelation as a way of life for Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, is that you establish this deen, this way of life, and don't have ikhtilaf amongst yourselves. As it relates to the first part, and it said is built upon the shahada la ilaha illallah. This shahada contains two parts, la ilaha illallah, and then the second one, Muhammad Rasulullah. And both of them are important, extremely important. They're important collectively and individually. Both of them are important. The shahada, la ilaha illallah. There is no God worthy of worship except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This shahada, ikhwani, has been called many things in the Quran. La ilaha illallah, this shahada, this kalima, la ilaha illallah, has a lot of virtues, it has its conditions, it has its understanding, it is an important issue. Can't stress its importance enough. Many, many words have been given to describe this shahada. For an example, Allah Ta'ala in the Quran, He called it the Kalima Al Uriya. Al Kalima Al Uriya. The word that is high and uppermost in an ayat of the Qur'an. وَجَعَلَ كَلِمَةِ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا السُّفْلَى وَكَلِمَةَ اللَّهِ هِيَ الْعُلِيَا Allah has made the word of those who disbelieve lowly. Isa is the son of Allah. There's no God. All of these words of kufr and shirk. With Allah, these words are low. With the prophets and the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa alayhi wa ajma'in, this word is low and significant. With the malakika, with the creation, this word is low. Although some human beings make it high, make it high, but so what with the human beings? Allah asks the human beings, أَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقٍ أَمِ السَّمَاءِ بَلَاءَ رَفْعَ سَمْكَهَا فَصَوَّاءَ are you people more difficult to create or the sky? The sky is more complicated and more exalted in its existence and its creation than Benny Adam. His beginning, his own beginning, his own beginning is insignificant. He himself despises his own beginning. Allah said that he was created from Ma'in Muhim, from a liquid that's despised. He thinks he's something. They think there's something. There was a man in the time of Jahiliyyah who used to say racist things against other people. He used to say, you were blacky and you're this and you're that and talk bad about people and, proud, and he would be proud about where he came from. The Prophet told us, he told his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, رضي الله عنه, أو من من رأيتم يتعز بعزاء الجاهلية فعدوه بهم أبي ولا تهم. If you see any man bragging about his origin and where he came from, he's bragging. I'm an Arab. I'm an Arab. He's from Tanzania, for example. 
He's from Kenya. This one is an original African from Kenya, from Tanzania. But his relatives come from Oman, Yemen. And he's saying, I'm an Arab, I'm an Arab. You're not an Arab, I'm better than you. Prophet Muhammad said, you see anybody doing that, then tell him to bite on his father's penis and don't sugarcoat it. Because if you're proud of where you came from, that's where you came from. What is right now going to walk around the city and say, this is where I came from? And everybody's going to say, hey, hey, what are you talking about? That's a place that is not a place where people are proud to talk about it in public. But that hadith, it wasn't the prophet being some of the light of lewd or inappropriate. He was speaking to the mindset of the racist, the one who's bragging. We are Africans, for an example. We're Africans. So as a result of that, like in America, African Americans, they will shoot you. This stuff has been going on for a long time that you're seeing right now. Had it not been for Allah and then for social media, you would have known. You wouldn't have known. You wouldn't have known. They shoot people all the time. And now even with the video, when they shoot people, still the video, they say, we don't know what happened before. So they always find the cop not guilty. They strangle people to death. Not guilty. People lose their lives for the tail light, the car is broke, and you lose your life. Women, men, young people. Because he chose to wear a hoodie to go to the store to get some Skittles, he lost his life. And it's always been like that. You go all the way back, I have some terrible nightmares to tell you. Muslims are right now talking about Islamophobia, Islam. This is new to the Muslims right now. This is new. We went to America, we came to the West looking for a better way, looking to melt in. And now when these people say, we don't want you here, the Muslims are freaking out. No, this is an old issue. Some people know this stuff from a long time ago. You know people in South Africa? They know this stuff from a long time ago. So there are some people, even Muslims, who exist with this. I'm from here and you're from there. You're black, you're this, you're that. And so I said, anybody who sees someone doing that, tell them, you proud of where you came from? All right, then bite on your father's penis. He said, don't sugarcoat it. Meaning say the word, the technical word. Don't say the street word. And don't say like you say for the baby, you know, some little kid word. Bite on your father's, you say a kid word. He said, bite on your father's penis. And I need to collect them. I need to to many, and it's authentic. And Imam Bukhari in his book, Al Adab al Mufra. So the point here, the point here. Allah has made La ilaha illallah high with Him, and the awliya of Allah from the Anbi and the Rasul and the Malaik and so forth and so on. That's one of the meanings of La ilaha illallah. Al Kalimatul Uliya. Al Kalimatul Uliya. The high word. He also called. This word, La ilaha illallah, al qawl thabit. Al qawl al thabit. The statement that is established. The established statement. La ilaha illallah is the qawl al thabit. Allah mentioned in the Quran, Yuthabitu Allahu al ladina amanu bil qawl al thabit fi al hayat al dunya wa fi al akhirah. Allah will establish those people who have Iman with the Qawl al-Thabit in the dunya and in the akhirah. In the dunya, the Qawl al-Thabit, people come to you and they want you to do something in the dunya and the Muslim is going to judge everything that he's being asked to do and to become involved in with his religion and he decides yes or no based upon the religion. So he's established based upon La ilaha illallah, being a Muslim, I will get involved, I won't get involved, I know how to do it. Some people come and encourage us, let's make khuruj. The Qawl al-Thabit, what is the religion saying about this? And so forth and so on. As for the hereafter, is his ability to say La ilaha illallah when he's questioned. Men rabbuka What did you have to say about that man who came? You have to know La ilaha illallah, the one who says, I don't know, I don't know, he's going to be in trouble. So it is al qawl al kalima al uriya and it is al qawl al thabit Another meaning that Allah gave this word, la ilaha illallah, this formula, is al kalima 
At-tayyiba. At-tayyiba. It is the pure word. At-tayyiba, the pure word. He mentioned in the Quran, Alam tara kayfa darab Allahu mathala kalimatan tayyibatan kashajratan tayyiba asluha thabitun wa far'uha fi as-sama tu'ti ukalaha kulla hina bi idni rabbiha Have you not looked, have you not contemplated and considered how the good word al-kalima al-tayyiba la ilaha illallah the good word, the pure word is like a good tree, a shajara tayyiba. This word is like a pure tree. And he went on to describe that tree. That tree, its trunk is deeply rooted in the ground. It has rules and regulations. You're just not left like that. Christians are left like that. Yahoo, left like that. They alter their religion on a daily basis, a weekly basis. They want to revise the Bible, they revise it, they put ayat in, they take ayat out. If you are members of a church, in this particular church, the preacher, he says he's a prophet. So now after you've been in the church for three months and you've been consistent in your attendance and in giving money, he says, okay, you're a prophet now as well, you're a prophet, you come and sit over here. After six months, you become a prophet and then he's a prophet. And then when you get a divorce, you do something that the church doesn't like, they say, we take your prophethood away. You're not a prophet no more. They want to make religious celebrations. They make a celebration, they take away the celebration. Islam is not like that. Islam is not like that. I, Abu Sama, can't bring anything to this religion. When I come to this religion, I don't bring anything into the religion. Nothing. Nothing to add on. I come into the religion, and I do what the religion is telling me to do. Within the confines of that building, I do what I've been commanded to do. I don't add anything. No moly, no special dhikr, no special way of dressing, none of that. The one who's born and raised in Islam, you can't bring anything. The religion is toti fia. Toti fia means you can't do anything. We had a janazah yesterday in Burma. Five of our brothers from Gambia during the month of Ramadan at the end they were working and a wall fell on them and crushed them to death. Rahimullah. Crushed them bad. Their body parts were all over the place. Couldn't be identified. So they died fasting in the month of Ramadan. And as the Prophet said, Innama al amal bil khawatim. As I told you before, your deeds will be judged based upon the last thing that you do. Anyway. We expected a lot of people going to come from the outer community, so we didn't hold the janaza in the park, in the mystery. We held it in the park. A lot of people came. And because Gambia is one of those countries where Islam is weak, knowledge is weak. They're Muslims, but knowledge, knowledge from the regular people, I'm the tenaz. There's a lot of Sufism, a lot of things that are not from the religion there. In West Africa, synagogue. And it's because of many issues. And it's the Imam being colonized. So many issues. The point is, when we had that community there, we were explaining to them, in our religion, you see these five bodies in the coffins, in our religion, no one here can bring anything new. How are we going to pray the Janazah, or what we do, what we don't do. From the time those people were born, to the moment that they get put in that ground, we know everything that we have to do. And it's not for anyone to come and add anything in that whole process. From the time that you're born to the time that you die, as it relates to the religion, as it relates to Ibadah, outside of the Ibadah, no problem. Create what you want to create. You create a Cadillac, you create a Corvette, you do this kind of computer, you, no problem, no problem. But in the Deen, in the Deen, don't tell me, the Deen. So, the kalima, la ilaha illallah, is the kalima that is like the shajara. And kalima al-tayyiba is roots are deeply rooted into the ground. And its branches reach high into the sky. You hold on to it, you practice religion, you elevate in the dunya the akhirah. And this tree will give those people who eat from it, it will give them fulfillment as long as they want to eat. So the point here is, la ilaha illallah has been called, al-kalima 
Also from that, and there are a lot of issues, Khwani, from the hadith of the Prophet وسلم, also from the Quran, Al Urwatul Wufqa, Al Urwatul Wufqa, which means the grass that never breaks. The grass that never breaks. La ilaha illallah is that. Like in Surat or Ayat al Kursi. Al Urwatul Wufqa, what is that? It is the grass that never breaks. And never breaks the ayat after ayat al kursi. Allah wa li wa li na amanu yukhrijuhu min al gulumati al nur wa li na wa li na kafiru al yam al shaytan. Or what is the ayat again? Al rubwa al wufqa. Okay. What you say? لا إكره في الدين قد تبين الرشد من الغيف من يقف بالطاغوت ويؤمن بالله فقد استمسك من عرة المفقى لن تصام لها There is no compulsion in the religion No compulsion The truth stands out clear from falsehood It's clear from falsehood And then the ayah said Whoever disbelieves in the false deities And he believes in Allah Then that is the grass, the handhold that never breaks Abdullah ibn Abbas said, this is the kelim of la ilaha illallah. As for his importance and his virtues from the sunnah, haddith ula haraj. Abu Hurairah came and he said, Ya Rasulullah, man as'adu al-nas fi shafa'at al-yom al-qiyam. He said, Ya Rasulullah, which one of us will have the most right for you to intercede on his behalf, yom al-qiyam? He mentioned sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam and qala la ilaha illallah khalis ibn qalbi. Anyone who says, La ilaha illallah with ikhlas, he'll have the right for me to intercede on his behalf. So if he's making mistakes or she is making mistakes in the dunya, and the person is afraid, maybe I'm not doing enough, or maybe I'm not doing it the right way, or maybe I'm just not good enough, don't give up hope. Make sure that your comprehension and your understanding of La ilaha illallah is intact. من قال لا إله إلا الله خالص من قلبه the one who says لا إله إلا الله with إخلاص not just saying it لا إله إلا الله just saying it but إخلاص means it's free from shirk so he's saying لا إله إلا الله but he believes that his shirk can alter the rotation of the earth and the rotation of the sun and the moon and he can alter the color and so forth and so on. So you're saying it, but you're not saying it with ikhlas. Ikhlas is to be free from shirk. They've been commanded to worship Allah alone with ikhlas. Worship Him without any shirk. Another thing about the virtues, and this is important for this mission, it's important for all of you. That is, when people want to come into the religion, obviously, they have to say this kalima of a tawheed, la ilaha illallah, this formula. So in order to come into the deen, this kalima has to be used. And this ijma between the ulama, that if a person has the ability to say la ilaha illallah, and he doesn't say it, he doesn't come into the religion, even if he says, I believe in it, but I refuse to say it. He has to say it. So when we have these people who want to come into the religion, to show you the importance of the kalima, remember this, is the hadith as a son of Bukhari and Muslim. Prophet Muhammad said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and Qala la ilaha illallah, wahtuhu la sharika la, aw ashadu an la ilaha illallah, wa anna Muhammad abduhu wa rasuluhu, wa anna Isa abdullah wa rasuluhu, wa kalimatu al-qaha ina mari, wa ruhu min, أدخل الله تعالى الجنة على كان منه على ما كان منه من العلم. He said anyone who wants to come into a religion and he bears witness and he says I bear witness لا إله إلا الله and Muhammad is رسول الله and I bear witness that Isa is رسول الله and I bear witness that Isa is the word from Allah that was directed to Maryam. And I bear witness that Isa is a spirit, a roar from Allah. 
anyone who says that when he comes a Muslim, he bears witness to that, Allah will put him in Jannah irregardless of what would pass. So he did crazy things. He said about the one who becomes a Muslim in Islam, Islam wipes away what went before it. And one of those companions had a problem. Ya Rasulullah, I want to become a Muslim. I really do. But I did a lot of bad things. I did a lot of bad things before Islam. A lot of bad things to people. A lot of bad things to children, animals. I was crazy. I was over a boy. The person is saying, if you can think of this sin, I did it. I was a real criminal. Killed so many. I was terrible. So, so, so. I want to become a Muslim, he said, but under one condition. That Allah forgives me for what I did. I want Allah to forgive him. Forgive me. He said, don't you know that Al-Islam wipes away what went before? If you become a Muslim, you're a brand new baby. So, from the virtues of this kalima, is that when people become Muslims, they say, La ilaha illallah. I bear witness, there's no God worthy of worship except Allah. Muhammad is his messenger. Isa is his messenger. Isa is the word that Allah directed to Maryam when he said, Kun fayakun. He said, Be and became without the Father. That's what that means, a word from Allah. Allah said, Kun, and he became, he said a word. And he is a spirit from Allah. He's not Ruhullah Khumini in Iran. He calls of Ruhullah Khumini, the spirit of Allah Khumini. La kalla. And I mention this to you brothers so that you'll always be on point about the danger of the dawah of the Rawafit. We have to be careful with the dawah of the Rawafit. There was a time when in Africa. You didn't even hear about any Shiaism. You never heard about it. Now, Shiaism is everywhere in Africa. It's in East Africa and spreading. It's in West Africa and spreading. You never heard of Shiaism. People come and curse Abu Bakr Umar and Islam. Aisha. Yeah, you found a person who drink Khamer. You found that. A person who is down in Islam and the apostates. You find that. But you didn't find people cursing Abu Bakr. You didn't find that in Africa. So because of politics and because of many issues, because of money, if you don't know your religion, right? Calling Fatima, Fatima as Zahra. Many people from the Sunnah, the Khatib, they'll call her Fatima Zahra. That's a famous description of Fatima. Don't use that description. That's a description that the Rafa they use for her. Just call her Fatima. That's it. Just call her Fatima. Because the people who hate the companions use that thing, so we don't want to be like that. When we say the companion's name, we say Ali, radiallahu anhu. Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. They, when they say Ali, they say Karram Allah Wajhahu. Karram Allah Wajhahu. So we're going to avoid that. Although that dua, I can say that to you, it's a nice dua. Karram Allah Wajhahu. May Allah beautify your face. Prophet Muhammad said, Nadr Allah Umri and Sami'a Maqalati. May Allah put light and illuminate the face of the person who memorized my hadith the way I say it. So you make dua for a person, Nadr Allah Wajhahu. May Allah give you light in your face in the dunya and in the hereafter. The Prophet was sitting with some of the women, some of them were they were talking and talking now the way women do. Their voices were high. And Rasulullah was just being patient because he was an easygoing individual. They weren't being disrespectful, but they were just talking now. You know, when there's a dars and the women are talking, people can't hear. And the Prophet just relaxed, he didn't do anything. And then Umar saw permission to come and he said, Come. He came in. When the women saw him out coming, they all jumped up, they put the cobs on and everything like that, and they went quiet. Rasulullah started smiling. When Umar saw the smiling face of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, made a dua for him. May Allah always keep you smiling. Why do you smile? He said, well, before you came, these people were talking, and they were talking, and they were loud. But as soon as they heard your voice and you came in, they were quiet. Um, I said to those women, hey, you enemies of your own souls, Rasulullah has more right that you have this respect than me. Than me. 
So some people want to use this incident of Umar as authentic, and they use this 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 incident, and then they add on weak hadith, weak lies. Umar went to his wife, and his wife said something to him, said something back to him out of the side of her neck, said something back to him, and he said, "How dare you?" The lady said, "Who do you think you are? Talk to Umar like that? Who do you think you are?" The wives of Prophet Muhammad talked to him like that, and you think it can't be done to you? So Umar went to the Prophet's house and he saw the people talking like that. So the woman is using this weak hadith as Dalil to talk to her husband like that and said, The women did it to Umar. La wallahi. La wallahi. There are brothers who are sitting here right now. I think I, I don't know. There are brothers who are sitting here right now. His wife would dare not talk to him like that. He won't do that to him. You think he's going to do that to Allah? So leave those weak hadith and leave what is not authentic. What I told you was an authentic point. So it's permissible to make those dua. Karnam Allahu wajhahu. But why only Ali? So we should avoid those things because those people are known by it. That's the point. Fatima al Zahra. From this kalima of la ilaha illallah ikhwani from the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the beginning of the da'wah in Allah. The beginning of your da'wah in Allah. I think everybody here is engaged in giving da'wah in some shape, form or fashion to your relatives and to non-Muslims. Your da'wah has to be centered around this kalima. They want to invite me to the University of Bedford University of Reading, the University of London, Birmingham, whatever. This mystery or that mystery. Okay. What do you want me to talk about? They say, we want you to talk about how to bake an egg. That's the name of the lecture. We want you to talk about how to cross the street. We want you to talk about Black Lives Matter. We want you to talk about Abu Sa'd when you come to our masjid. We want you to talk about the best ingredients to cook matoki. For an example, whatever they tell me to talk about, whatever, when I come to give dawah, I have to connect that to a tohid. I have to connect that khutbah, that dawah, that dars to a tohid. Amazing, amazing. There are those people when they give dawah to Allah, all their kalam is about politics. And Henry Kissinger, he sat on the blue chair. And George Bush is retired, and he's over there. And the Illuminati, they used to own that thing over there. And over here, the arrivals, they have a special spaceship, and it's in Hyde Park, but it's being hit, and they're all going to get it right away. And they're going to rule the world. And they just tell us stuff about politics. So we ask those people, a fitnahi shak, like the ayah of the Quran. Allah said, You have doubt in Allah? Why? Why you never talk to us about Allah? Always politics, always. And then there's an individual, his doubt is all about Jannah. Jannah, real stuff about Jannah, real stuff. The souls of the believers are in green birds flying around, mashallah. The homes of the people of Jannah are like this, mashallah, the Quraim, mashallah. And the people sitting there, Allah, Allah. Because it's true, mashallah. But we didn't teach the people who created the Jannah and showed you the way to get to the Jannah. And we didn't warn the people about innovation and those things that will prevent you from going to the Jannah. So the point here, Khwani, is none of you, none of you, should ever allow people around you to say to you, until when are you going to talk about Tawheed? When are you going to stop talking about Tawheed? There's always Tawheed, Tawheed, Tawheed. The answer? I did never, inshallah. Because the prophets and the messengers didn't stop talking about Tawheed, ever. Never. So when the prophet said, Mu'adh ibn Jabal, radiallahu anhu to Ami Yemen, he said, فَلْيَكُمْ أَوَّلْ مَا تَدْرُوهُمْ إِلَيْهِ let the first thing you call those people to, Ya Mu'ad, is the shahada. 
لا إله إلا الله محمد رسول الله and that goes to show us when and Islam was built upon five pillars but the pillar of a shahada is the most important one all of the other pillars are dependent upon this one so the five pillars are important they are important they're not all of Islam but they are important all five they're the most important most essential but out of these five the shahada is the most important because the rest of them depend upon it it is the foundation of the foundation and the aspect of the shahada that's most important is the first part the kalima al-tayyibah the shajra al-tayyibah the kalima al-uriya the urat al-wuqa let the first thing you call them to la ilaha illallah it's because of this kalima that Allah sent the prophets it's this reason وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونِي we never sent the messenger before you, Muhammad, except that we revealed to him that there is no God worthy of worship except me, Allah. La ilaha illa ana. We never sent any messenger. It's this kalima that we do jihad. This kalima. Umirtu an uqatil al nas hatta yashhadu wa la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammad al abduhu wa rasul. I've been sent to fight the people until they bear witness to La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. Earlier, I gave you brothers the definition of Al Islam. It is what the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the prophetic definition, and it is what I told you, Al Islam, to submit with those three components. If you ask the Muslim, what is Islam? And he says it's peace. You call a person's idea at the soul word. At the soul word. What is your comprehension of this? If I said to you people, close your eyes, guys, and uh, get, make a picture of the Kalimanjaro mountain. Kalimanjaro. Isn't it called that? Kilimanjaro. Man, we say it American Kalimanjaro. <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh. Because in English, when we say deja vu, French people look at us and say, hey, you messing up our language. You don't say it like that, deja vu. But everybody don't. So we say, Kalimanjaro. <laughs> I know a Muslim brother, he called his son, because he loves Africa so much, he called his son Kalimanjaro. That, that doesn't make sense. There's fiqh in naming your kid in the religion. I know a lady, she has a child. One child is Nigeria. His name is Nigeria. Another kid, his name is Benin. And the other kid, his name is Senegal. And that's because they're reverse and they don't know in this house of Islam, there's a way of doing everything. And you can tell a lot about a person the way he named his child. Imagine that mountain, Mount Fuji. They call that at the soul. What comes to your mind? What's the image in your mind about the issue at hand? So if someone says, what is Islam? What the person understands is Islam is peace. So if his understanding the image of Islam is wrong, his application is going to be wrong. His Tao is going to be wrong. What's your understanding of a jihad? A jihad to some people is confusion. Jihad to some people it is revenge. Jihad to some people is I don't have anything better to do so I might as well destroy something. You know some kids they grow up and they like matches. You can tell them a thousand times, hey man, don't play with them matches. So while you're somewhere else, he's in his bedroom somewhere with some matches, playing with matches with the curtain. Because some people are like that. I can't, I, I, I got a lot of free doubt, it's got to destroy something. <laughs> but is that the right jihad? Is that the right salat? Is that the right marriage? Is that the right this or that? So our tasawwur of the deen has to be a particular way. As it relates to this kalima, and uh, as I said, we can mention a lot of things. Is that it is that peak of the matter. He mentions sallallahu alayhi wa sallam al-imanu bid'un wa sabarun shu'ba a'laha qawlu la ilaha illallah. Iman, iman. There are 70 levels of iman. 70 degrees. 70. From Al-Iman 
Let every truly believes you love for your brother what you love for yourself. It's a part of Iman. Part of Iman. Many, 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 many levels. He said the highest branch, the highest level is La ilaha illallah. So, so many things can be mentioned about this particular kalima. So many things. So many things. But we'll complete it here by mentioning, inshallah, azawajal, this kalima, because of it, people enter into the jannah and the hellfire becomes haram for them. Because of this kalima, people go into the hellfire and the jannah becomes haram for them. Prophet Muhammad told the people, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in Kana, Akhir kalami la ilaha illallah, dakhal al-jannah. Anyone who the last thing he said that came out of his mouth, the last thing he said is la ilaha illallah, guaranteed jannah. And somebody going to come and have the nerve to say, we're going to stop talking about Tawheed. We're going to stop talking about Tawheed. The prophets and the messengers will come and get down to khayr. Like the people of Lut. They criticized Lut. And you know what the people of Lut, what they were doing. They said, Uqtulu Lut. Fa'inu yadruna ala tahar. Kill Lut. Because he's inviting us to be clean and pure. Fight him, kill him. Get rid of him. Kick him out of the city. Because he wants us to be pure. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? And that happened with all of the prophets and the messengers. They came and they gave life for the people they wanted death. When, when, when are you going to finish talking about Tohi? How can you say something like that? Tohi should be something that resonates in the minds and the hearts of the Muslim community because of its significance and its importance. It is the last thing you say in your agenda. So isn't that worth our time, our while? to be people who acquaint ourselves with the dhikr of the ma kuntu ana wal nabiyuna min qabri la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lahu wa lahu al-mulku wa hamdu ala kulli shay'in qadeer the best dua on the day of arafah that i said or any other nabi said la ilaha illallah it's the best dua that a person can say is la ilaha illallah he mentions sallallahu alayhi وعلى آله وسلم ما من أحد يشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله صادق أو صدق من قلبي إلا حرم حرم الله على النار. anyone who says لا إله إلا الله with truthfulness and believing it, Allah will make it haram for him to go to the hellfire. so we mentioned this very briefly, إخواني, and that's just touching the surface of the importance of this كلمة. This masjid right now, this has to be masjid of Tawheed. If the Imad came and he gave a khutbah about the reason why Allah created the creation was for his worship and la ilaha illallah. The reason he revealed the books was because la ilaha illallah. The reason why he created the Jannah the Naar, la ilaha illallah. And the reason why he sent his messages and his prophet so I said, la ilaha illallah. And he gave the khutbah. Then we get another visiting khatib. He gets on the member and he starts talking about the conditions, the seven conditions of la ilaha illallah. And then he gets down praise and he leaves. And then the following week, someone comes and he starts talking about the arkan of la ilaha illallah. The arkan of Islam. Five pillars of Islam. La ilaha illallah has arkan, has pillars, two. One pillar is a nephew, and the other one is a thabat, a nephew. Not nephew, my nephew, my niece, my nephew in Arabic. A nephew, nephew, and an ithbat. What is a nephew? A nephew is to negate, and the other one is to establish. Those are two pillars of La ilaha illallah. To negate, there is no God worthy of worship. Negate. All guys that are there, they're not worthy of worship. And then you affirm, illallah, accept Allah. Those are the two pillars of this particular kingdom. So this brother comes in the third week and he gives a khutbah about 
the arkan, the name of la ilaha illallah, and why it's like that, and what's the importance of it. And then the fourth week, another one came, and he broke down to us the ayat of the Quran, 37 ayat in the Quran, 37, that mention la ilaha illallah, over and over and over again. And he wants to give us those ayat. And then the fifth week, another imam came. And the fifth week that imam came, and he talked about the linguistic, what's going on linguistically with la ilaha illallah. Every dance that comes, the Muslim is rejuvenated from that kanab. Because it's part of his DNA, it's part of what's inside of him. What's inside of him. Just like the plant outside, when it rains, we can't see it. But those plants are reaching to the sky. Like some of you brothers, and I'm always giving these examples of Africa only because I'm from Africa and I just is close to me. But some of you brothers, in these last weeks, it get real, real hot. A few days, three days, it get hot. And many of you brothers complain. Although you can clearly see we've been in the sun for centuries. That's why we just come with melanin. But when we come to Europe and stuff like that, we start complaining the sun, sun, sun. Some of us, real Africans, when we go outside and it's a hot day, we just like that. We look at the sun like that. We want to take a, 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 a whistle in the bath in the sun. Because we come from the sun. So you guys have to return to your roots. Anybody who starts complaining to me and he says, hot is hot. And I'm looking at his color and his pigmentation. I said, oh, that guy that came in, he lost where he came from. <laughs> he lost where he came from. So the point is, the kalima la ilaha illallah is like that. It's like a shower when you're hot, when you're going to make hajj, inshallah. And we'll talk about this next week, David and that. When you take, make hajj, hajj, you're in that sun every day, all day, on minna. And most people, even from Europe and Africa, from Europe, there's no fans. And um, Arafat, no fans. And you are like sardines. And when you get in there, you, you can't breathe. But you get used to it. So some people have a little water bottle and they put the water on it. When that water hits you, it makes an ayash. It makes you come alive. Like that thing they do when you're in the ambulance. It makes you come alive. La ilaha illallah has to be like that. La ilaha illallah has to be like that. So a lot more can be said, but we're trying to make this thing brief, but this is something we're not going to let go by, inshallah, as we And the second part of the shahada is Muhammad Rasulullah. So the first part says, there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. Well, Muhammad Rasulullah there is no one worthy of being followed unconditionally except Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That's the meaning of that. No one should be obeyed and followed unconditionally. So it is a bid'ah, it's an innovation for someone to come and say, you must have a medhat. You got to follow one of the four imams. That's an innovation. Where do you get that from? Where did the companions have a medhat? You don't have to follow anyone. You have to follow the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alayhi wa sallam. Wa ma arusamna min rasoolin illa li yuta'a bi idhnillah. We never sent any messenger except for him to be followed and obeyed. Wa ma aataakum al rasool fa khudu wa ma nahaakum anu fa intaw. What he gave you, take it. What he leaves from you, don't take it, leave it. What he makes haram and prohibited for you. Ya ayyuhal ladhina sijabu. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amru sijabu lillahi wa rasul ila da'akum bima yuhyiko. Oh, you believe. Answer and obey the call of Allah's messenger when they invite you to that which will give you life. Don't be. The sunnah will give you life. Cause you to grow. Develop. So all of those ayat indicate this. That the Prophet said in the second part of the Shahada, the Rukun, the second part of the Shahada, the most important Rukun Shahada Tain, the second part of that, no one deserves to be listened to, obeyed unconditionally, except the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Only him and no one else. Allah mentioned those ayahs of the Quran, like his statement.
اتبعوا ما انزل اليكم من ربكم ولا تتبعوا من دونه اولياء قليلا ما تذكرون follow what was revealed to you by your Lord the Quran and the Sunnah and don't follow the awliya don't follow your awliya even if they're from those imams don't follow the awliya follow the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam don't follow your culture don't follow all of these other things that will cause you to be a person who disobeys the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so we'll deal with the other four arkan inshallah next week but you can see how in the with the other four arkan how are we going to give a quick class on a salah? How are we going to give a quick class on a soul? How are we going to give a very quick class on those two pillars that everyone is doing? How? But this class is not designed to be stretched out for a long, long time. But this is an issue that required a 10B. It required us bring it to your attention. So if your brothers have any questions, inshallah, as we you can put your questions forward right now. Barakallah fikum wa asalamu alaykum wa sallamakum Allah min kulli su'um wa makruhim. Alaykum shaykh. One of the virtues of uh, the shahada that enters people into Islam. When someone is becoming a Muslim, do they have to say the Shahada in Arabic or they can say that in the language? Now, concerning saying the Shahada in Arabic, it's not a necessity to say the Shahada in Arabic. As a matter of fact, I would advise that you don't do that. Because it is one of the things that will cause a person to be afraid to embrace Islam. And you can possibly run the person away. And the Hadith said, Give glad tidings and don't run the people away. So if someone were to ask me to stand up and to say in Swahili or Yugoslavia or Urdu a sentence, I be a witness there is no God worthy of worship except Allah and I be a witness openly that Muhammad is his message is certain. I will be embarrassed to try that out in front of a group of people. I would be embarrassed. Everybody's like that. So some people, their uh, personalities is a situation where they don't mind. They're strong. They'll do it. Their conviction, they'll do it. If this is what I have to do, you become a Muslim, I'll do it. But some people are ultra shy. Some people are extremely antisocial. Some people suffer from, uh, uh, what is that, anxiety? Um, where they don't like being around people. They come into a room, they're very uptight and uncomfortable. They don't want to meet new people. Some people are like that. So why make them say the shahada in Arabic? Let them say the shahada in the language that they know. He speaks English, 60-70%, and he speaks Swahili fluently in front of the people, give him the shahada in his language. So that he knows and he understands what he's saying. So there's no delil for that. As a matter of fact, the delil shows contrary. Prophet was sent to his people with his insan, with their insan. We never sent a messenger to his people except he spoke their language. Allah sent a human being. It is sent a jinn, it is sent a malaika. He said the human being, someone who they can relate to, who spoke their own language. And the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, used to speak to some of the companions that came from Yemen in their own dialect. He would speak to other Arabs of the peninsula in their own dialect. The Quran was revealed in seven dialects, Saba Ahruf, seven different ways to recite. So that the Arabs could appreciate all different ways because they came from different places. The Nabi of Islam, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, used to say words of Abyssinian origin to Bilal, to Salman al farisi Showing ikhwani, communication, it is an art. And the da'i has to be able to communicate. 
He has to be able to communicate with the people who are listening to what he has to say. Because if you can't communicate, you're going to have problems. Musa said, Oh Allah, send my brother Harun as a wazir to help me out. Some of the ulama of Islam said that Musa had a speech and pen, but this is just kalam. We didn't find that this was authentic because we know that one of the main ingredients, one of the main characteristics that have to be in a prophet is has to be clear because he's given the message. He's given the message. So the person with the speech impediment, we're not going to put him there to educate the people as such, as such. So the short and end of it is, give him the shahada in your own language. Now, anything else? Anything else? Those sisters have a question. Just send a question to the little kid. Fuck them. <laughs> I have a question. I think that we all... Ahi, Ahi, can you pour me some of that um, tea in this, please? Which one? The famous one. <laughs> the only one. Fuck that. So I think that we all know... You see this brother right here, Abu Isa? I said, Abu Isa, I have to go to Bedford today. Are you available? He said, Bedford? Yeah, I said, yeah, Bedford. He said, is that the mystery where they have that good tea yet? Allah, <laughs> that's what he said. He says is that the masjid. He didn't say is that the masjid where Juma is. Is that the masjid where the brothers are nice? Is that the masjid where the brothers give you food after the dars? Is that the masjid that you come in the parking lot? This is the small. He says is that the masjid where they give that good tea? Yeah? I say yeah. Allah. <laughs> okay, so I think that we all know people from different and other religions like. Uh, Jewish or Christian. Uh, so uh, those uh, people love uh, their religion. They are, uh, for example, Christians. They love being Christian and they do all what their religion is asking to do. And the question is, are those people that wrong? And how we Muslims have to tell them that they are those people are, that they are wrong to say that to a Christian? You are wrong like this way, he will be angry of it and he may never agree with uh, Islam. So, are the, first question, are they uh, wrong for God, uh, in the point on, in the God's point of view? And the second question, how uh, right. can we... People are on other religions. The Deen of Islam said, La tikraha fiddeen. There is no compulsion in the religion. You can't force people to change their religion to become Muslim. They have a free choice. So since everybody has a free choice, can we say that they're wrong for being Jews and Christians, for an example? Because if we were to tell them you're wrong, then they may get upset, they may get angry. In order for a person to get his hands clean, you and I, in order to get your hands clean, you have to rub one hand with the other and there has to be some friction or they're not going to get clean. So sometimes you need some friction. So all friction is not bad. Some friction, when it comes, it brings fire. You're not going to say, oh, it's a bad thing. No, this is a good thing. So Allah has created everybody, clearly, to worship Him. Created them to worship me. Every child is born saying that and I Allah. The mother and father make him a Jew. The environment make him a Jew. So the person got away from his fitra. And every day there are ayat going on, signs, every day calling him back to his fitra. Every day. If you just look around and stop being like an animal, take the time out to look at that sun coming up and going down every day. At his progression, he was a little kid, now he's 53, he's getting hairs that are gray. You're going to die soon, just like you go to sleep every night, Allah's going to wake you back up. And there is a seed inside of everybody telling him, La ilaha illallah, you didn't create yourself. So the Muslim has a responsibility, part of Islam, a da'wah illallah. That's part of Islam. 
the five pillars, and part of it, one of the window, is you go to the window and you call people. You go in your door, you call people. Probably give an example, some of the some of you said, method with method and be able to cover the method and bait. The example of me, the example of the prophets who came before me is an example like a house, a castle. People came and they looked at the castle and they marveled at it and said, wow, how beautiful it is. But there was one brick in the corner that wasn't there. They said, how beautiful this castle is only if that one brick was here. Prophet Muhammad said, Anna til kalimina. And I'm that brick. Meaning, I came to complete all of what the other prophets and messengers came with. So we're going to give dawah to people from Islam. From Islam, giving dawah from the window and stuff like that. Like those ayahs told us. Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat middas. You are the best ummah brought forth for the people. Urduru ila sabili rabbika bil hikmah. Wal mu'idhat al hasana. Wajahidhum bil nati kiya asana. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعِلَ اللَّهِ All of that is our responsibility. This Islam. But how? We got to tell them about Islam and the goodness of Islam and the evil of what they're doing in a nice way. We're not going to go to people and say, you know, you're dumb and your father was dumb and your <laughs> grandfather and your grandma, all of them were dumb because you're not a Muslim. We're not going to call people to Islam like that. We're going to do what the Prophet did. Prophet Muhammad got before the people and he started telling them, La ilaha illallah. And when they started arguing with him and being obstinate and being stubborn, he started hitting them with arguments that they couldn't deal with from the Quran. He started hitting them with these arguments and with these intellectual things. Not heavy and deep, it's just things that everybody could appreciate and understand. So we don't worry that people get upset. We don't try to upset people. We tell them the truth. Like you have to tell your wife and she has to tell you. You have to tell me, I have to tell you. You have to tell me, I have to tell you. You have to tell our children. They don't like it. They don't like it. But we have to tell people the truth. What's the second question? Second question. Uh, you forgot. No, yeah, no. The, uh are they wrong? I mean that those people, for example, they go to the church, they practice their religion in uh, in their point of view in the good way. So are they wrong? And are they this? Now they're wrong, Ahi, because as I mentioned earlier in the talk, yes, uh, the kalima of Allah and kalima to Ruliya, it is high with Allah, but with them it's not high. But which scale is the important one? Is it Allah's skill or the skill of the people? Allah's skill. So they themselves don't see themselves as being wrong. They don't see themselves as being wrong. But it doesn't mean that they're right. And this is what's really important for us as a community, and you young people too. You know they use this word about trending. That's trending. It's trending on the social media. Something happens so it's going around. It's a famous thing, like Black Lives Matter, they shot the black people in America. So it's trending, it's something everybody's hearing. Or this is a trend, so people follow these trends. They dress this way, they talk this way, they behave this way. This is European culture, but most cultures are like that. People follow trends. Muslims are not like that. Right now they talk about the environment. The environment is important global warming and all of this stuff and recycling and all of this stuff and it's important but I'm going to give a chuppah about global warming and, 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 and this stuff because it's trending and everything that's trending you'll find the Muslim ready to get involved in it remember that song happy happy it was a song that that R&B guy made, Pharrell is his name, I'm happy, and then everybody started making it. Muslims made it, everybody making it all over the world. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? The, happy, huh? Happy Muslim. Happy Muslim, like they sing it to that song. It was a famous song, a catchy song. People did it in Albania, people did it in Russia, people did it everywhere over the world. And they're singing this song with hijab, that's trending. The ice bucket challenge. 
You guys know the ice bucket challenge? You take the bucket and you, and then the Muslims said, okay, let's do our own version. Let's just get dirt and drop it on to connect people to Palestine. So Muslims tend to do that, copy whatever is going around. Muslims shouldn't be like that. Crazy thing is, when these things come to us, we don't ask where it comes from, we just do it because this is what's trending. But when Allah or His Messenger tell us to do something, when the Hadith tells us to do something, we start saying things like, that's not in my manhap. We start saying things like, I never heard that before. We start saying things like, well, that doesn't make sense to me. We start saying that, well, I don't take the Quran, I don't take the Hadith. We start saying, but that was doing Prophet Muhammad's time, this is a new time right now. So when it comes to trending and where we don't even know where it comes from, we're ready to take it. In Saudi Arabia right now, Medina and Mecca, Medina and Mecca is just an example. Medina and Mecca. There are kids from the Shabbat wearing winter hats, winter, winter hats, with jeans in them, like the uh, rap people in America. And it's hot where they're living, the lady from Pakistan, a young girl, the Kim Kardashian of, of Pakistan. Her brother killed her, they say. You guys aware of that? There are many you travel in the Muslim world, travel in the Arab world, go to Kuwait, go to Qatar, go to Saudi Arabia, travel in the Muslim world at the airport, you will see many Kim Kardashian clones from the Muslim girls. The way they comb their hair and the makeup, that look, that these girls are after. Because Kim Kardashian is trending the way she looks, the type of <coughs> changes she makes in her body. This is a Go anywhere in the Muslim world, in the big airports, and you look, this is the fashion of the Muslim women. But then, you bring them a hadith like Al Isbal, Al Isbal. There's a hadith that says, nothing should be below your ankle bone as a man. Your thobe, your pants, whatever you wear, shouldn't go below your ankle bone. It should be above your ankle bone. Many Muslims find that hard to practice. They say, that ain't important. That's during the Prophet's time. That ain't important. This, that, whatever excuse. Well, as long as I'm not arrogant, they make every excuse. But then when the hip-hop people started talking about this and they started dressing like this, Hip-hop people dressing now with their pants above their ankles. Kofar hip-hop rappers have beards now. They have beards. Many of them have beards. The black ones got beards. They're not even Muslims. They wear t-shirts that go long over the aura. When that started happening, you found the Muslims practicing it now. Why? Because the hip-hop people are doing it. But when Prophet Muhammad said to do it, yeah, that's too, that's too extreme, it's too much. Too much. Now you let these football players, uh, Messi and these famous football players, you let these people come and do something. Let them come and do something. Whatever it is, let them do something from Islam. If they started growing their beards, for example, then Muslims are going to grow their beards because we look at those guys as the people that we follow and to the idols that we know. I'm just giving those as examples, but the point here at Kwani is, even if people don't like what's being said when we say to them, your religion is wrong, what you did is wrong, although they don't like it, in order to get the hand clean, sometimes you have to uh, love it. Okay, Kwani, we're going to stop here, inshallah, as we do, and uh, we'll complete hadith number three next week. Hada, wa sallamu wa sallamu على رسولنا الأمين الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه الأجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.